Let's, uh, let's begin this morning with just uh, a word of prayer. I, <coughs> I, I, I'm sure that all of you probably uh, are avid watchers of the news, right? And um, our world is in a bit of turmoil at this point. I had this, uh, an opportunity this past Friday to have a very lovely meal with some of our neighbors who are at the new place where we're living. And uh, it was uh, a very interesting conversation. Uh, and I just, out of curiosity, I asked them, I said, well, what do you think is going to happen with Taiwan and China? And um, everybody has their own opinion. So um, I say that because uh, I would say the likelihood of there being some major conflict going on in our world is, is uh, extremely high, extremely high. And uh, there's uh, one of those reasons is because there's just some men who have huge egos who want to prove what they can do, that's all. And sometimes there's bullies on the block who like to stick their finger in somebody else's eye just to show that they can do that. Uh, I'm not going to name any names or anything, but <coughs> I think it would be a good idea for us to just pray about it. What do you think? So let's just bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, I'm grateful that we can simply like this come to our Father in heaven, our creator, our Lord, our master, the one who brought this universe into being, the one who brought this world into being, the one who has brought us in this time and this place. And uh, Lord, as we, if we believe everything that we read, not that we should, but uh, it seems as if there's just quite a bit of turmoil going on in our world. There's threats of uh, major wars to happen. And uh, we just live under that cloud. We live, live in this situation. But thankfully, Father, we can turn our eyes to you and say, Father, we're just going to depend and wait upon you. So I pray for our world leaders. I pray for those who would like to be empire builders, who would like to broaden their borders. I pray for those um, that you would speak to them, Lord, to not be so, not to be aggressive, but to uh, look to caring for their own countries. I pray for those leaders also who are attempting to keep peace. And Lord, for leaders who are attempting to lead their people to value freedoms and to value their choices in, in our world, I, I honestly, Lord, I, I kind of like the idea of there being a king, and I'd like you to be the king, and I wish you were, and you will someday be the king of this world, and we look forward to that time. I pray for our local leaders, Lord, in um, this country, in our cities and, and uh, counties. I pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom as they have to make important decisions. They have to make uh, uh, important laws to pass. I also pray, Lord, for our business leaders. Again, in a world that we're just coming out of this pandemic, there's issues and critical issues and decisions. And a lot of these have to do with our safety and our peace, our health and our well-being. And I pray, Father, for wisdom. I pray that they might seek our, the wisdom that comes from God. And then for Grace Church, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the privilege you give us to meet like this. And it's for uh, the continued, Lord, spiritual leadership and the continued vision of Grace Church that you might find those people who can stand in this position, Lord, to be able to continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, Lord, we have a need in our ministries for volunteers and leaders in our children's ministry and discipleship ministry for the hospitality and the welcome. And Lord, as we heard just a bit ago about our financial stability and provision, we can give our thanks to you, Lord. You've brought us through a very difficult time, a very uh, dry time, and yet we can see how, Lord, the, the th things are trending up for us. So we just want to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that you alone deserve for that. And I ask you, too, for that your hand would be upon those uh, outreaches that we have into the community and the outreaches that we have in places like uh, Zhanghua and, and Taidong and then also in Bangladesh and Nepal and other places around the world where we're wanting to see your word be spread, your word go out. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit would uh, reveal to us your will, that you would speak to us through your word to our spirit, Lord, and that we, as your people, at this time, at this place, we would yield, we would submit, 
we would just give in to you and let you be indeed our Lord and our Savior and our King. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Uh, Amen. For the past several Sundays, several, four, (laughs) depends how you look at it, I guess, we've been uh, talking about things having to do with the spiritual world along with our human makeup. So what I'd like to do then is do a review of the last four weeks. Actually, my sermon this morning is very short. It's just a couple of sentences, but it's at the very end of the sermon. What's really long today is the review of what we've been doing the last four weeks. So I need to move along. We started out with um, speaking about keeping in step from Galatians uh, chapter 5. And verse 24 says, if we live by the Spirit, we also keep in step with the Spirit. In this, there's, we learn that there's an obvious distinction, an obvious difference between what our human desires are and what um, God has in store for us, what He would like for us. Our human nature in sin is quite separated from the grace of God. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit of God that we need then his guidance and his direction. So I want you once again to take a look at this list. It's a list, not one that I've compiled. It's a list that a guy by the name of Paul, who is an apostle and an early church planter, he put this together as he was writing a letter to a church in Galatia. And this church in Galatia, they were converts of his. He planted that church, but in their uh, faith, they moved away from the faith that they had in trusting in Jesus Christ to one of them trusting in their religious practices. And Paul had a lot to say about them. He was telling them that there's these works of the flesh. These works of the flesh, there are base human instincts, our base human nature, plainly, clearly, easily evident, evidence of our fallen nature. May I say that we humans are not nearly so good as we think we are. (laughs) We would like to think of ourselves as highly civilized and very easy to get along with people, but I just, uh, the the longer I live, the more difficult I find that to be true. But on the other side of the list there, we we find what is called the fruit of the Spirit. Bear in mind that this is a singular fruit. It's not fruits. It's not like we pick and choose. This is the fruit, the produce, that only comes through the very Spirit of God. This is what Adam and Eve forfeited when they yielded to temptation. This is the desire of God in, in, in coming to redeem us, that we might enjoy, that we might embrace these fruit. And the thing we need to understand about this is this fruit can be had and enjoyed through our, our human spirit. It comes when we are in communion with and seeking life from God's Spirit. The next week, we looked at the matter of dividing of soul and spirit. And this comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, when there's uh, a speaking of the, uh, uh, the Word of God that's able to divide, to penetrate, that is, the spirit and the soul. And, and here is something that I think is very important for us to understand uh, about our, our spiritual makeup, our spiritual construction, as it were, with our spirit, with our body. The thing is this. We would want this fruit of the spirit. No matter how much though we want this fruit, we find it elusive. We find there's, there, there's things that are keeping us from that. And if you would like a perfect description of that, you can go to the Romans chapter 7. But we find ourselves, our person, our fleshly desires, on the one hand, one, something that we're drawn towards, but on the other hand, we see the beauty of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, so if we, if we look again at the list here, I want us to notice something here. We, we notice that our body is, that it's, it's physical, it's also our soul. There's our soul and there's our spirit. And how does that then fit into Paul's plan here? The desires of the flesh. 
These are the, the functions that we, that we practice in our body. It's our, our raw human nature. And we just have a tendency because of our fallen nature to drift towards these fleshly desires and fleshly acts. Now, our soul, though, is in the center. It's between, then, the flesh and our spirit. We all have a spirit. It's through our spirit that we have this fellowship with God, whereby we can fellowship with the Spirit of God. The Bible says that God is a spirit. They that would, will uh, fellowship with him will worship him. They that worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. So our soul is that human essence, our emotion, our will, our mind. But the spirit then is whereby we can communicate with the spiritual world. It's in our spirit that we worship God. However, in our fallen nature, our soul is aligned with the flesh. We just have this soulish tendency that direction. And it's very easy to illustrate. If you've ever raised children, your children have never drifted towards love, joy, peace, obedience, goodness, faithfulness, these things. It's our human tendency to go the other way, and we need to be taught. We need to be shown these things. So we look then thirdly at the flesh versus the spirit. This battle that's within. Our flesh tends, it, it, our soul tends towards the flesh, but it's the spirit then which we see these, these fruit that we would like to enjoy. The point is this. Our soul is under the power of the flesh. That's why we would be called fleshly or carnal. A word used um, in, um, by Watchman Nee is the word solical. In other words, soulish, where our soul is one that has come to prominence, and it's our soul that determines what part we'll have with the spirit, what part we'll have the world, and we seem to be going back and forth like this. And, and Jesus puts it very simply as to how that took place. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he says, you must be born again. This is the whole point. Without the new birth, there cannot be then the crucifying of the flesh and the enjoying of the spirit of God. In our first birth, we're born in the flesh. Duh, here we are. We're flesh and spiritually separated from God. God's response to that is this. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. It's incredible. God's response is, all right, I'm going to enter into this human flesh. He became human flesh. He became human in every sense of the word, while at the same time remaining as God, almighty God, omnipotent God. His response to becoming flesh through the is to live perfectly that life that we are unable to live, that by his perfect life he might redeem our flesh, our flesh. He might buy us back. This is called the second birth. This is called being born again. This is where you see Jesus fully paid for our punishment, for our judgment. Jesus completely put sin to death in order to give life to our spirit. It's through the atonement. That word atonement is at one meant. It's the state of being as one with God. The atonement. That atonement allows us access into our new life, into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God. I, I, I say those words and I don't mean for them to come glibly out of my mouth. It just blows me away, folks, to think that we as broken humans are given access through Jesus Christ into the holy of holies, the presence of God. That is where the Jews were not allowed to go except for the priest, the high priest, once a year to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. It's, and, and we, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have how should I say, always access. We live in that presence because 
of God's work in our lives. The fourth Sunday, which was last Sunday, we talked about the crucified life and the centrality of the cross in our life. The centrality of the cross in uniting us together to God through the Holy Spirit. We must understand that that work of Jesus Christ on the cross was all-encompassing. There was nothing left out. It was a finished work of Jesus. It is Messiah Christ, his crucifixion on the cross completely takes care of it. There's nothing we can add to it. We can't take anything away, though sometimes we may try. So Paul strongly, vehemently actually, emphasizes the centrality of the cross to our spiritual life. In other words, folks, no cross, no crucifixion, no hope. And so he pens this verse. We looked at this last week. This is a great verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It's only the cross of Jesus Christ that delivers the, bel the believer from flesh and its possessions. So, let's look again at, again at that list. When we look at the list, we see that we're not under the law anymore. That through the redemption of the body, we then draw close to the spirit, and the spirit then takes preeminence over the body, and therefore the control, the pre, excuse me, the spirit takes preeminence over the soul, and then the control of the body. We're no longer controlled by the flesh. Why? It's crucified. The flesh is crucified. We, and, and I want to make this point very clear. It's not maybe. It's not later. The crucifixion of the flesh in Jesus Christ is done, done, done. Done deal. This is where we need to learn how to live in that way. Not under the influence and the control of the flesh. The rule of the Holy Spirit in our, in our spirit, through our soul, ruling our body. This restores us then to that state where, where God intended us to be. Now, I, I understand we're, we're still in these bodies. The flesh is is not totally eradicated. And, and here's why, folks. When, when Adam sinned, that's when death came, the, the, de the curse of death came into this world. Why is death necessary? Because this flesh cannot be redeemed. The flesh must die. Now through the, the role of the Holy Spirit and our fellowship with him, we then realize that our flesh can be suppressed, but it always creeps back. You see, it's not until that rapture takes place. This is what we're looking forward to. This is what our hope is, that we're going to be renewed. We're going to be made whole again. That's when we receive our glorified body, just as Jesus did when he rose in the resurrection. Unto then, here's what we do. We live in crucified submission to the Spirit of God. Th this is what Paul is, is, reading about, is teaching us about here through this passage, these passages of Scripture. Now, for today, I, I want us to look at <clears throat> a couple of passages of Scripture. I want to look at <clears throat> that which is called the new creation. Excuse me. The new creation. In other words, when we began, we talked about this thing called our soul hunger and how these human instincts, uh, these human hungers, they can be fed one way or the other, either through the works of the flesh or through the uh, fruit of the Spirit. 
But as we look at this new creation, how do, how do we understand that in our relationship? You see, uh, let's read from Galatians chapter 6 and verses 11 to 13. Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 to 13. And Paul starts by saying this, See, with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted by, for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Let me just look at some things in this passage of scripture here, we'll, we'll, and then we'll continue on uh, with the last part. The, the thing that we ought to see here is Paul is developing two mindsets, two ways of thinking, two ways of looking at this. He's developing this contrast in one, and this was the problem that, we were, that they were having in the church in Galatia. It was the spirit of legalism. Why is that a problem? Well, the problem is this. The problem is not having the rules. The problem is when we defined our righteousness by hell, well, how well we keep the rules. That is where the problem lies. And so Paul is saying that in the spirit of legalism, there's a, a striving, a trying so hard. We try very adamantly not to fall into the ways of the uh, flesh. And when, we can, when we're able to not fall into the ways of the flesh, we just kind of go, yeah, see, I'm a pretty good Christian. I'm not doing too bad. I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't dance with those who do, something like that. That's very trite when it comes right down to it, especially when you talk about adultery and, and uh, the, the sins that it's, it's talking about. He's speaking then, on the other hand, there's this rule of a new creation, a new creature. There's this new life that enjoys with deep satisfaction the fruit of the Spirit. Now, uh, stepping back to verse 11, it's interesting. <clears throat> we don't usually write handwritten letters anymore, do we? I don't see anybody raising their hand real quick saying, yeah, I write handwritten letters. Uh, when's the last time you got a handwritten letter? When's the last time you wrote a handwritten letter? So the thing is this, is that uh, for Paul, and, and, and why do we need to explain this? Because we're becoming, becoming so far removed from handwriting, we don't even know what it is anymore. We just have to keyboard, da, 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 tick, 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 that kind of thing. So when Paul says, I have, I, he talks about his handwriting. See with what large letters I'm writing uh, to you with my own hand. Paul had a problem with his eyes. And just like on my telephone, I've increased the size of the font because I can't see that little font. For Paul, it's the same idea. He's increased the font of his writing so he can see what he's writing. And he exclaims. In fact, his, when we read it here, it's, it's almost mid-sentence, mid-thought. He says, let me tell you about these awkward large letters that I'm writing with my own hand. In other words, he's saying that he writes that Paul typically would have a secretary with whom he would dictate his letters. The secretary would write them down, talk with Paul about whatever changes need to be made, and then Paul might, at the end of the letter, give a word of greeting and so forth, and that's where he would do the writing. Uh, according to the commentators that I've read about, it seems as if Paul, because there's no mention of somebody that he's with having written the letter, it seems as if Paul wrote this letter by himself. In other words, he was in such a fit of consternation about the situation at uh, the church in Galatia. They're drifting away from their faith. They're drifting away into a faith of uh, a, a, a religious, religious practice of works. It so caught him that he said, I must write a letter. I don't have a secretary. So he gets out his pen and papyrus and, and who knows how big it is and how many words he gets on one page, but he begins writing that letter and he just exclaims here, you see what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand? It's an expression of his concern. It's an expression of his 
a very urgent sense that you're, you're being corrupted of the good news of salvation. You're returning to your own effort, to your own ways. And that's, it's not hard to do, folks. We can become very proud of the religious and the spiritual things that we do. And we like to do them so people can see them. That's not of the Holy Spirit. That's of our own soulish nature whereby we want to be recognized. We want people to see what we're doing. Paul begins then in this, the letter to the Galatians with this exclamation of disbelief. It's like, are you kidding me? I can't believe this. Let me read it to you. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Those are fighting words for Paul. Not that there is another one, but there are some of you who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel that is contrary to the one you received, let that person be accursed. That is very strong language. You see, the issue here is not about different interpretations. It's not about different perceptions or different nuances in the gospel. It's here two different gospels, and Paul will not have it. In one of them, people before, people before God on the basis, uh, in one of them, people come before God on the basis of their merit. In the other one, they stand before God on the merits of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. In the one gospel, humanity stands before God in the righteousness of their own human doing. In the other, <clears throat> we stand before God realizing there's nothing I can do to satisfy God. There's nothing I can do to make myself worthy of what he's done. In the one we're taught, this law thou shalt do and thou shalt live. In the other, it is live by the grace of God. And by the grace of God, then do the work that he gives you to do. That, that hits, hits pretty close to me. I just think that this is, there's too much religiosity that goes into, you need to do this. You need to do that. And if you do this and you do that, just like we tell you how to do it, then you're pretty good. And it, it feeds on the person who's making the rules and one who's keeping the rules to think, ah, see how good we are? In the one, the law commends us, makes demands upon us in order that we may obtain life. In the other, it's the grace of God that's offered to us, it offers us eternal life. It's conferred upon us through faith. Given to us through faith. In the one, the doctrine leads to inflating our human pride because it suggests that we can do something acceptable to God. In the other, our boasting shrinks down to only our trusting, only in bragging on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all he has done for us. So Paul has a very strong bit of language to the Judaizers. He greatly disturbs him, their their outright public promotion of doing the law and works. <sighs> I'd like to say I don't understand how that can happen, but I totally understand it. I come from that kind of background where it was so much about how we act and what we do and saying the right things at the right time and being at the right place at the right time. But he, he's saying, Paul is saying, no, no, no. It's not religiosity because religiosity is nothing but hypocrisy. Notice what he says there in verse 12. They want to make a good showing in the flesh. In other words, it's all about appearances. It's all about what it looks like. It has nothing to do with the heart. 
Let me tell you how it works for pastors. Pastors go to pastor's meeting and they kind of uh, um, rub shoulders and so forth. The question always comes up, well, what's your attendance like? Yeah, we have 200 people coming on Sunday, you know. It's like, who cares? But this is how we pastors do it. And I know we just had a uh, financial report today, and it was a good financial report, and I'm very glad for it. Oh, but God help us if we start bragging about it. Look at our finances. See how much money we're bringing in? Oh, and by the way, let me tell you how that works. Look at how many missionaries we're supporting. Y you know, all of those things are good things, but the problem is this. We use those things that are fleshly things to determine that we are doing God's good work. And it's not about that. It's this, just the desire to make this good showing. You know what that is? That's not a spiritual tendency. That's our soulish tendency. That's ourselves. Wanting to bring ourselves up rather than to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Or we might even say, oh, bless God, look at how well we're doing. Oh, God knows the heart, folks. God knows the heart. Look at also in verse 12. They are afraid to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. They're afraid to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Their pride is not accompanied by courage. They have no courage to stand by the cross. They simply want their pride to be lifted up. They won't, don't want to be associated with the offense of the cross. And folks, I might say that this is one of the biggest problems of Christianity today, and I use the term broadly. It's because we, we have such a warm, sentimentalized, fuzzy feeling of the cross. Sometimes we wear it in our ears, other times we wear it around, around our necks, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's so contrary to what the, the cross of Jesus Christ uh, is. It was, it was horrible. It was ugly. It was uh, dehumanizing. And it's like wearing a noose around the neck. You think about that, folks. I uh, Think about for a moment what it's like to be a, a human that has been strung up. The noose is around the neck. They're getting ready to hang them from a tree or from a hangman's uh, uh, post. That's what the cross is. And I don't see any of us wearing a noose around our neck. I don't see any of us glorying in the noose. And yet, Paul says, I glory in the cross. You see, they, they had so sentimentalized the cross that they, weren't, they were afraid to have the courage to stand up for it, to be identified with it, with the cross of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, this, in verse 13, they do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. And this happens way too often. Way too often. It happens too often to pastors who stand in a pulpit and they freely propagate the word of God, but they themselves do not keep the law. I want you to keep it, but I'm a little bit more holy than that. This is why, this is why we have such a problem in, 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 with people saying, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church. Why? We're, we have this hypocrisy about us, this, whereby we go by the motions, and it, it's not something that fills our heart. You see, these, these are hypocrites. They're wanting to keep the rules and keep the law, but they're not going to. Their, hypocr their hypocrisy is because they want to brag on the legalistic behavior of those who follow them rather than on the humble spirit, or spirit of embracing the cross of Jesus Christ. So, Paul goes in this next section, reading from Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. Here he points now to that cross. Beginning with verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ 
by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And I promise you it wasn't a tattoo. Not against it, I'm just telling you that you don't show your Christianity through your tattoo. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Amen. Here, Paul is speaking about the cross and glorying in the cross. He, he does not boast about his religious scars. He boasts, or that would be his, uh, the circumcision of his Jewish past, but he talks here about three crosses. I want you to notice this uh, very quickly about the uh, crosses. He says there, <clears throat> far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first cross. Now, he does not say in the death of Jesus Christ. He could have, but he emphasizes it's the cross. It's the ignominy of the cross. It's the embarrassment of the cross. It's the shame of the cross. And it's this cross which our Lord Jesus Christ was pinned upon. He talks about the second cross, that the world has been crucified to me. Because of that cross, he says, I am crucified to the world, to the flesh, to the things of this world. And then he says, the third is, I am crucified to the world. The world is crucified to me, I am crucified to the world. The cross on which Paul died to the world. The very next verse he says this, circumcision then doesn't mean anything. It counts for nothing. If you're circumcised, fine, good on you. If you're not, it doesn't mean anything. He's saying this, there's a new thing. It's a new creation. You see, Paul is living in a new space. He's living in a new dimension. He's living under a new covenant, as it were. He's living under grace. Those who live in this covenant of grace, we, we live in this uh, peace and mercy uh, be upon us. Why? It's not about us anymore. We don't have to keep up the appearances anymore. We just simply need to yield to God and let him take care of it. We don't have to worry about all these things. Do this and do that. Simply focus our attention. Yield and give in to the Spirit of God. He closes then by saying this. Don't bother me. Bugger off, some would say. He's, he says, don't trouble me. Let no one cause me trouble. I bear my body, he says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Now let me ask you a question quickly. Do you bear in your body the marks of Jesus? What would that be? What would it be about our body that identifies us? Paul was one who said that he, he kept down on his body. He kept pushing it down. He didn't want that, his, his flesh to come and take control. He kept suppressing it that he might be able to exalt the Spirit of God. So I want to just speak to you very quickly about this matter called the, the, the new creation. What is the new creation that Paul talks about here? This new creation, <clears throat> it's what exists when the old mindset of the law is crucified at the cross. That's, when we, that's why Jesus says, uh, when he's talking about that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he says what? You must be born again. In other words, the flesh has to die. There has to be a new birth, this new creation. The new creation is what exists when that old mindset of re religiosity is crucified with Christ. And so, to put it in theological terms, it is this. The new creation is the believer's ontological transformation in Christ. I looked at that and I go, what in the world is that? It just simply means the nature, how 
the nature of our being. The nature of our being is transformed in Jesus Christ. And that's what this new creation is, is when our very nature is transformed. Listen, folks. When we're talking about a new birth, we're talking about being born again, something happens. You're not the same person. And if you're the same person, you need to look again. A change takes place. It, we don't remain the same. So this new creation then, it's related to a fundamental change in our nature. Because the old nature has been crucified. Let's just go back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Some, some, uh, some wise person said we call it 220 power. Here in Taiwan we use 110 and sometimes 220. But it's a, it's, it is powerful. It's the crux. Therefore, he says, uh, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet not I. Yes, who, because I live, but Christ who lives in me, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he goes on and he says this, this ontological thing, uh, um, this, this change in our nature. Here's what Paul says when he's speaking to the Corinthian church. Now, mind you, mind you, just very quick now, and I have to move quickly. When he's speaking to the Corinthian church, you need to understand he's speaking to carnal, fleshly people. And, and he understands where they're coming from, and he, he's, under, he's telling him, here's what needs to happen. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Done. It's a done work. It's a finished work. We need to live in that work. I am dead to self. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old has passed away. You see, there's a, there's a learning process that goes with that. It's interesting because when Paul's writing to the Ephesians, he expands on it a bit. He's, he tells how it's learning from Jesus to put on the new life. He talks about putting off and putting on. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, he says, But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming, assuming that you have learned about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So again, you see where we're coming from here? That two lists, those two lists that we have? And then to put on the, the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the whole purpose for going through this is to show that we humans are made in such a way that yes, we've fallen, but we've been redeemed through the cross of Jesus Christ and we need to put on the new life, the new self, created in the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, no faking it. Paul says, to those who follow this rule, peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule. So what we have here is this, this contrast of the, of the mindset. If we look in verses 12 and 13, he says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. That's the one mindset. It's the one of the, the works, the effort, following the religious procedures and so forth. The other mindset that Paul describes here is, and, and all the, excuse me, the verses 12 and 13, they're described as self-exalters. They are exalting self. Now when we come to verses 14 and 15, we read this. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And this mindset describes the Christ exalters. 
And that is where the difference lies. Where, to whom then is going to be lifted up? Are we going to lift up ourselves as self exalters? Or are we going to make it our life's goal to exalt the Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? In the new life, the new creation, the whole question of the rules, the rights, the religion, the regulations is irrelevant. And I didn't think that up. But I'll say it again. It's a great way to remember it. The new life, the new creation, the whole question of the rules, rights, religion, and regulation is irrelevant. Gone. In Christ, we're a new creation, new creatures, ruled by higher laws, loftier principles. For everyone who has entered into the life in Christ, what are we trying to do? We're seeking to cultivate and, and to grow in this, this new sphere. It's a daily walk with God. It's a daily yielding to God. It's, it, it, and it, it's a promise of the benediction of mercy and peace. Paul can see only trouble and heartache for those who are deluded in accepting the religious nonsense of the Judaizers, of the ones who pump those rules on us. Now again, folks, please don't get me wrong, because we do have guidances in life. We do have ways we have to, we have to live. But the problem comes when we're living those rules as self-exalters rather than Christ exalters, rather than emphasizing the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the answer to our soul hunger is this. It's in a new creation. We won't be hungry to seek after the works of the flesh because the flesh has been crucified. It's been denied. It's as we open up ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to the Spirit of God, through our own spirit, it's then that we, our, 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 our hunger lies for spiritual things, the fruit, the beauty, the wonder of the Spirit of God. Our new life comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The works of the flesh are buried with Jesus. They're gone. The fruit of the Spirit is new life in the resurrected life of God. It's a daily walk. That's why every day, we need to wake up and say, Lord, good morning. I need to walk with you today. Let's walk together. Let's fellowship together. It's daily looking unto Jesus, keeping on looking to Jesus. It's not our theology. It's our relationship that builds our theology. As we draw closer to Jesus Christ, we come in, to, in worshiping him, in obeying him, in yielding to him, and desiring for him to lead us, guide us, direct us completely and entirely, looking unto Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the way that you've made us. Thank you that even though a long time ago we fell into sin and we chose sin rather than to fellowship with our Creator, but that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you took care of all that. You came, took on our flesh, dwelt amongst us, you went to the cross, bore all of our sin, past, present, future, for all of mankind, and we, Lord, can experience the new creation, the new life that comes through living in and through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for opening up the way into the Holy of Holies. This is where we want to live, in your presence, all day long, all the time. Lord, please transform us, make us, mold us to be more like you. Looking unto you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, I ask you as we go out into the world, as we go out into the life that's around us, that we be the light of the world, that we take this message, Lord, of salvation and freedom that comes in Jesus Christ, and that we live the new creation that you have intended for us to live. I pray these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you again next week. Uh, next week, we're going to start a new, ser- new series of sermons on the book of Revelation. You'll want to be here for that. Right? That's right. Oh, yeah.